The surface of the land is breathtaking in its variety and in its beauty. Providing an exciting... Mud, earth, dirt. No matter what you call it, we've all walked on it, played on it, and even studied it in school. But what important little secrets do these jars hold? And why would someone want to keep them for the last 80 years? The Cleveland Union Terminal Collection is the construction archives from the building of the Terminal Tower Complex on Public Square in the 1920s. There's hundreds of boxes of office reports, uh, rolled drawings, images that chronicle this massive urban renewal project that in many ways foreshadowed the Rockefeller Center and other big urban projects of this nature. And it culminated in the building of the Terminal Tower, the icon of downtown Cleveland for generations of local residents. One of the things that's really very fascinating about the tower is its location and the things that went on underneath it. In essence, we're right by the river. Um, the water's flowing, which means you're going to have erosion. You're on fill and sand and stuff that isn't really firm, so they went down very deep. The other unique thing about it is you're, they built the railroad tracks underneath while there were active buildings that are still active on top. So you had two very unique problems. One is in the construction, you had a great deal of vibration and they had to make sure that they didn't shake down the buildings above while they were building the terminal tower. Plus, at the time when they were building it, the buildings above remained open, which meant all the construction caused a great deal of vibration, too. So there was a lot of work done in terms of the construction methods, which were very cutting edge at the time, and still work today as you have active buildings above that active railroad. When we talk about the Cleveland Union Terminal, we talk about a number of buildings that together form a big complex on the southwest corner of Public Square in Cleveland. The first was the hotel, which actually predated the site. Then came the station, which was the whole reason for this complex in the first place, the train station, which would be a union passenger station for all trains entering Cleveland. On top of that was then built on the air rights, as they call it, a number of office buildings, uh, the landmark office towers that we know between Huron and Prospect, and then capped off, of course, by the, the terminal tower itself, which was the icon of uh, the project. Building the Cleveland Union Terminal Complex was a challenging project for the engineers involved. A great deal of time and effort was placed in the preparations made before breaking ground, including the drilling and recording of multiple deep earth core samples. This is one of many core samples that were collected by the soil engineers for the Cleveland Union Terminal project in the 1920s, trying to determine what the subsoil conditions would be in the project area around, along the river and in the approaches leading into the downtown project. The soil samples were carefully labeled and recorded on a map that would show the locations of the borings and what they found below the ground. All of this material was then uh, stored and for the last 40 or 50 years has been kept in the Tower City archives where Drew Rollick, the archivist, kept it preserved until it was transferred to Cleveland State. But they're, they're, they're tremendously valuable. I, I realize they, they don't look like it, but, but they are when you consider what it would take to try to duplicate them. Uh, when these samples were taken, the area around Public Square, uh, the buildings were all torn down, it was all dug up, and so you could go and take your sampling devices and dig deep and uh, come up with the kind of sediment information, lithological or rock information that, that, you, uh, that you need. And fortunately, these stayed around, were kept safe for all these years so we can study them now. Imagine if you wanted to do a study like this and you needed to take fresh samples, well, what are you going to do? Go to Public Square with a drill, drill rig and say, well, okay, everybody out of the way, we're going to punch through the street here. Well, you probably hit electrical lines and gas lines and uh, there'd be infrastructural problems, uh, to say uh, the least, uh, but besides it would be very, uh, very disruptive. So uh, there's concrete, there's asphalt, there's infrastructure. And so you can't just go uh, take these. Also, even if you had a clear area and you had a drill rig and you had a crew, it's phenomenally expensive. You're talking about tens of thousands of dollars in investment in equipment and in personnel to take these. And once you take them, you have to separate them, organize them, label them, collect the data on them. So the fact that these were here and available, 75 years old, 
dusty, a little, a little gritty. All that doesn't matter. They're tremendously valuable because you basically can't get this information now. Core sampling continues to be used even today as an important tool to understanding the geology of an area. This is a getting soil probe. This takes cores hydraulically. As the core barrel goes through the ground, the bit will cut a sample that is a slightly smaller than the core barrel and it will be pushed up into the barrel. Once the core sample has been drilled, it is removed from the barrel and then sliced open for inspection. What we have done here is we've cored through a fracture in the till. You can see the light colored carbonate material which has been transported from the upper part of the deposit down along fracture systems. This demonstrates that water does move through some of the glacial clays, especially tills. This has implications in terms of landfill siting and hazardous waste sites. The Cleveland Union Terminal Collection includes a great number of maps that were produced to show the locations of the different borings that were taken, and then the subsoil conditions and profile of what they found in each of those locations. And according to these reports, we find that the top layers tended to be ash and sand and then moved down through various kinds of gravels and clays until they finally reached the shale at the bedrock level far below the surface. The borings also include samples from those different places, and all of this was brought together in the archives. The way that buildings were built, especially tall buildings at that time, was you went down to bedrock and you put down caissons on bedrock to hold the building up. Um, here that meant that they went down about 200 feet to finally hit bedrock and they put in caissons, 16 caissons, to hold this building up. Um, that compares to the Chicago Tribune building that has about 100 foot caissons. And so it was quite an engineering feat for the day. These samples are, uh, are, are special and they're really the samples that the, uh, the engineers were really seeking because uh, these represent bedrock. This is the chagrin shale. This is what the engineers were looking for under the terminal tower. They spent all that time, all that money, uh, probing downward uh, through the loosely consolidated geology, you could say, to look for the solid foundation. Here the solid foundation is exposed. It's uh, apparent for everyone to see, and there's really not much material uh, above it. Uh, this is bedrock. We are looking at bedrock. These archived core samples are not only important because of the difficulty in attaining them today, but also because of the massive changes that occurred in the area as a result of this urban renewal project. Cleveland had been wrestling with the issue of a Union passenger station coming into town all the way back to the beginning of the century with the group plan over what we now call the mall. And the Van Swearingen sort of hijacked that plan and moved it to public square where they could bring together a number of different transportation modes in one spot and then construct a commercial environment around it instead of the governmental environment over at the mall. So as a consequence they developed the air rights over the station heavily uh, including the terminal tower itself which was a massive project to basically make the, project, the terminal more successful financially. The conditions on the southwest corner of public square in the 1920s were a large number of commercial blocks and residences all through the area between the corner and over the, to the river. This was all chronicled in a series of photographs that were taken by the uh, Terminal Tower people, the Cleveland Union Terminal people, before they demolished and excavated that whole area. So some 1,000 buildings were actually taken down uh, in the course of doing this, and several streets were eliminated and a whole new set of streets was brought in, carried up on bridge-like structures over the tracks. What's important about the core samples is that they come from an urban area. One of the habits of man is when they go to urbanize an area, they like to fill in holes, they like to fill in ravines. So as a geologist coming along 200 years after a city is beginning to grow, all the natural exposures have been covered up with anthropogenic material. So the core samples give us an insight into the deposits that are in the area, especially the very deep core samples that we wouldn't have a chance to see even if the area was left naturally there. As a result of the analysis that was done by the soil engineers, some 2.5 million cubic yards of material were removed in the course of building the tower complex. It's a deceptively complex undertaking 
because it takes so many different people doing so many different things to basically get all of the information uh, out of these. And this is very valuable information because it tells us about the history of our, our area. It tells us about a history of climate, a history of environment. That's, that's pretty hot stuff now, global change. Uh, to figure out in a way where we're going, you have to have some baseline data uh, climatically, environmentally to say where we've been. Well, about a year ago, Mike Tevis contacted me about taking data and using software packages like this and doing visualizations on that data because that's what this software package does. It doesn't just focus on atoms and molecules. It takes any numerical data and makes a picture out of it if you could tell it how. And so the data were the various characteristics of the core samples that had been drilled 70 or 80 years ago. And what Mike wanted was to visualize the values of different parameters, different uh, characteristics on these core samples, to try to get a three-dimensional understanding of what the distribution was of moisture levels or particle sizes or carbon content and that sort of thing with the idea that having a visual three-dimensional image of that would have a better understanding of what was going on underneath the shores of Lake Erie. I study glacial geomorphology usually in this part of the world it means looking at landforms that were created by the glaciers through the process of deposition or melting. An example would be the end moraines or the looping ridges that represent the terminal location of the ice sheet in western Ohio. We're at the famous glacial grooves in Kelly's Island in Lake Erie. These grooves are thought to have been made beneath the ice. Originally at the turn of the century, scientists tell us who have observed this island that there were about nine sets of grooves on the island. These grooves were clustered in sets of three or four. This is the sole remaining groove. Originally, also, this groove may have been about 400 meters long. It is about 5 meters deep and 20 meters wide. We can think of the base of the glacier as a toothpaste, a toothpaste with abrasive in it. The toothpaste that has abrasives in it are used to whiten your teeth by sort of scraping off a, a layer of enamel. We can think of the base of the glacier as operating in a similar fashion, having particles of rock frozen in its base, so as it flows over this surface of limestone, it can also abrade away the rock type, producing a new surface. Possibly the same ice that deposited the sediments that we find in the core samples for Tower City originated in the glacier that had advanced into this part of Ohio. The cores uh, from the terminal tower are proglacial, so they're in front of the ice, and that uh, those levels of Lake Erie are sort of not the modern day, but the, the proglacial lakes are important. Uh, they are basically the sand ridges that are around them uh, are an important source of sand and gravel from the old beaches of those, and that's the Middle Ridge Road, North Ridge Road, and that sort of thing. Um, and then by knowing basically the elevation of the, the various levels of the bottom of the lake, there's information as far as the depth that can be gleaned from these cores. My specialty is paleontology, and what paleontologists do is study the history of life based on fossils and other, other evidence. So we look at, uh, at old things, pieces of wood that can tell us how old something is, particularly if you carbon-14 date it. Uh, you can look at, uh, at fossils that, uh, there are animals sometimes that seem out of place. Uh, you'll find a, a coral, for example, a fossil coral in, uh, say, uh, a modern lake environment or something like that. And so what that tells you is that uh, in the past things were different when the, corals, uh, when the coral was alive. I'm standing here on the bottom of what was once a warm tropical ocean. I know it doesn't look like that now, but uh, what you see in back of us is, uh, is a lake. It's, it's raining, and so really we're enveloped in fresh water. We have the lake in back of us. We have the rain falling. Uh, but these rocks, uh, these rocks contain evidence of a really different uh, environment. Today we're in a temperate latitude were in essentially an environment dominated by fresh water. 
but when you look at the fossils and look at these rocks, these uh, rocks were deposited, or the sediments forming the rocks were deposited, and the fossils representing the creatures associated with those sediments, uh, this was all part of an ancient ocean, and not just any ancient ocean, it was probably a shallow ocean, uh, light probably penetrated all the way uh, to, the, to the bottom, so it was probably less than 200 feet deep. Also, it was a tropical ocean. Uh, these rocks are full of corals. Uh, these kinds of corals are ones that we think lived in tropical areas. Uh, in fact, if we consider the theory of plate tectonics and continental drift, and we look at reconstructions of what the globe looked like at the time these fossils and these rocks were, were being formed, probably this whole area was located somewhere around the equator. During the ice ages, when the climate was much colder, glaciers covered much of the land. Their tremendous weight and sharp edges tore great holes in the surface of the land, grinding down rocks and stones. The center of glaciation that affected Ohio formed in the Laurentian Highlands in the province of Quebec, Canada. You can think of the ice as a big lint roller. Material freezes onto the base of the ice, uh, moves along the base of the ice, and eventually is lifted up into the ice and transported farther south towards the limit of glaciation. When the ice begins to melt, the material that has been transported along or carried in the ice is dumped out in the form of glacial landforms such as end moraines and till sheets. We know that the last glaciation which affected Ohio that ended about 14,000 years ago generally flowed out of the Lake Ontario region southwestward towards Ohio. Within the sand fraction of those deposits, we find oolitic hematite, little balls of iron that come from the Clinton sandstone along the south shore of Lake Ontario. One of the values of working with glacial deposits is that we're able to take the stratigraphic record left by glaciers and convert that into a model of climate. Scientists working with this record have been able to reconstruct the shape of the ice sheet 18,000 years ago, 17,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, essentially a time series sequence. Based on the lab analyses, we were able to lump some of the layers designated by engineers into one event. We looked at these throughout the, all the core samples, able to come up with about four to five basic groupings. These include the fluvial deposits from the Cuyahoga River, which would be the youngest, the lake deposits that would be near the surface, and on the surface would be the beach deposits. Below the beach and lake deposits, we found glacial deposits such as tills, uh, outwash, and even some older tills near the bedrock at the base of the deeper holes. Most of the knowledge that we have from the history of climate comes from studying sediment cores, either from the deep ocean or ice caps or the like. To go back down into the sediments is to go back in time. And these sediments have all sorts of clues in them that can be translated into temperatures or trends or warm versus cool times or wet versus dry times. So by actually studying sediments from the deep ocean, studying sediments from the land, that's how we, uh, and it's a little ironic in a way because you dig into the earth to try to figure out what was going on in the atmosphere. But that's how scientists get at that. We can use the climatic models reconstructed from the last glaciation to possibly predict future climate change and whether the ice would retreat or advance. This is quite important in that if the ice does melt down, sea level will rise. If the ice were to melt totally, sea level would rise approximately 250 feet, which would mean the highest point in Florida might be Space Mountain. Glaciers did more than simply bring in rocks and other sediments to leave behind when they melted back. They were also instrumental in the formation of the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes form from pre-glacial river valleys. These river valleys essentially occupy where we find the Great Lakes today. The glaciers, as they flowed southward, generally scooped out these river valleys and modified them to make lake beds. The old bed of Lake Erie is referred to as the Aragon River, which flowed northward somewhere into Canada, cut across the Niagara Peninsula west of the current Niagara Falls. Within 
southern Ohio, we had a very large preglacial drainage system called the Tay system. Lake Erie is very different. It's the only one that uh, does not go below sea level. Um, it's, so it's the shallowest of all the lakes. And as far as pollution goes, this was very important because, yes, we were able to pollute it very quickly. And that was, you know, probably the keynote of that is the, the burning of the Cuyahoga River. Um, but what that meant was that when efforts were made to clean up the area, uh, the water coming in, uh, we were able to clean it up quickly because there's not very much water. And we just sent all that polluted water down over the falls into Lake Ontario, which although is area smaller, it's got a lot more volume, so it's diluted what we sent it. Lake Erie did not initially appear as we see it today. It was created slowly over many hundreds of years as the glaciers retreated. When the ice left and opened up the Buffalo outlet, uh, the Niagara River, with the outlet being so low, it drained Lake Erie into basically what uh, Jane Forsyth, the professor at Bowling Green, called spectacle lakes. And what you would have had is a lake in the eastern basin and just a small lake behind the Norfolk Moraine, which runs basically from Erie, Pennsylvania over to Long Point. And then as this level, as the, the bedrock sill at the Buffalo Outlet rises, it starts ponding more and more water behind it. The present lake uh, is, has, both, has a western, central, and eastern basin all connected um, with islands uh, separating the central and western basin. But not too long ago, this is about 10,000 years ago, the lake basically drained. This end of the lake would have been drained almost completely dry. And from here out to Kelly's Island would have been a, a basically rock and grass plain with a small stream flowing between it. And Kelly's Island would have been a very substantial hill on that uh, lowland. After a significant amount of testing on the core samples was completed, the members of the scientific team were ready to interpret their results. By looking at the composition of the sediment in the jars, we're able to correlate with other studies that we've done in northeastern Ohio. In my career at the University of Akron, I've examined about 8,000 samples of glacial sediments. So I have a fairly extensive database with which I can compare the samples from Tower City. This is one of the three-dimensional plots that we were able to generate that is looking at the moisture content uh, at the various drill sites versus depth. What these visualizations are giving us is an idea of how that particular attribute is distributed underneath the ground based on the measurements of the core samples. And what Mike can do as a geologist is by understanding how those attributes are distributed can back project what the environment was like thousands or tens of thousands of years ago when maybe the uh, geology was changing or this area was underwater and the shoreline was a couple of miles away. So as a geologist, he's able to infer what the conditions were based on the distribution of these attributes. When we learned of the existence of this collection of sediment samples, we were, we were very excited. We, we knew we had something very valuable here. Uh, these little jars of sediment to the, to the engineers provided all sorts of valuable information that made it possible not only to build the terminal tower, but to make it a safe, sound structure that will last for, for many years to come. And for our multidisciplinary team of scientists, these 80-some-year-old samples are beginning to reveal their, their dirty little secrets. Uh, these, these sediments are full of information about the history of our environment, the history of the climate of this area, and so we're learning things that are scientifically valuable and I think also have educational value uh, to the people of northern Ohio. What else are we going to learn from these samples? Well, there's still much to be revealed and, and time will tell. <laughs> <laughs>